Great. So I'm going to talk today about Tolkien's relationship with his fans, and particularly the uh, mail that he had from his readers, his fan mail. And um, I'm going to touch on what he received, who he came from, um, what his readers wanted from him, and then Tolkien's response to that. So it's based um, pretty much on the written record. I think I can safely say that um, The Lord of the Rings is one of the most popular books ever published. It's never been out of print since it was published in 1954 and 1955. It's been translated into, I think, 55 languages, um, everything from Albanian to Yiddish. Um, 50 years after publication, as we're coming towards the end of the 20th century, it was voted Book of the Century in a poll of 25,000 readers conducted by the bookseller Waterstones. And a few years later, at the start of the 21st century, it topped a poll by the BBC's Big Read to find the nation's favourite book. But was it popular when it was first published? Well, the book itself won two awards in Tolkien's lifetime, and Tolkien was given two separate awards for his own literary achievements. Um, so the first award that it was given was the International Fantasy Award in 1957, quite shortly after publication. Um, and although it's called International Fantasy Award, it was a British award, and it was given to the single best work of fiction in the field of science fiction and fantasy, and selected not by a popular vote, but a panel of experts. I don't know who they were, but... Um, Tolkien went to the award ceremony, which was held in London, on the 10th of September, 57, and he went along with his publisher, Stanley Unwin. And he described his, the presentation as uh, an absurd trophy, a massive metal model of an upended space rocket combined with a Ronson lighter. I'm not quite sure which bit is the lighter. Maybe it's, maybe it's the round bit at the bottom. Maybe the top flips open, I don't know. Is not very impressed. Um, in 1966, it was a finalist in the Hugo Awards for the uh, best all-time series. Uh, of course, it isn't a series, but this publication in three parts has always caused confusion. Um, that's it been described as a trilogy or a series. Um, he actually lost out to Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. It did win, however, in the Oh, excuse my French here. Uh, the best foreign book in 1972 in the Prix de Milieu, and that was for Francis Lidder's French translation of The Fellowship of the Ring, the first, the first part of Lord of the Rings. So those were the two awards it won. Uh, Tolkien himself received the A.C. Benson Silver Medal from the Royal Society of Literature. Um, that was in 1967, and it was for Outstanding Services to Literature. It was actually 14 years since a medal had last been um, awarded, so that was quite an accolade for Tolkien. And then finally, in the New Year's Honours list for 1972, just days before he was 80, um, he was made a CBE, that's a commander of the Order of the British Empire, for services to English literature. And he re received his medal from the Queen at Buckingham Palace uh, later in that year. Um, another way to look at uh, the book's popularity might be to look at contemporary reviews. Um, so there are lots of different reviews, uh, quite a varied response to his work from both critics and journalists. who seem to have found it quite difficult to classify. Uh, it was called Super Science Fiction, an epic fairy tale um, by W.H. Auden, a heroic romance. Um, C.S. Lewis also called it heroic romance and a romantic trilogy. Um, critics were divided. Was it a monumental waste of time or one of the most remarkable works of literature of our or any time? Tolkien himself wrote to his publisher in 1961, a sharp distinction must be drawn between the tastes of reviewers Donish folly and all that, and of readers. So by that time, 1961, um, six or seven years after publication, 
he was already realizing that it was a quite a divisive work. Um, I think part of the trouble with not being able to classify it and this um, you know, massive range of opinions as to its uh, literary worth was because um, in the 1950s, fairy tales were really still seen as for children and not for adults. Um, and if it was a fantasy work, it was more likely to be set on another planet and be a science fiction work. Um, I'm really not going to go much further into reviews because there's a whole other lecture there, which would be quite fun. Um, but I'm going to go back to fan mail, which is what I really want to concentrate on today. So my focus is going to be on um, the fan mail that Tolkien received, um, and particularly the fan mail that we have in the Bodleian Library. Uh, and for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to define fan mail as letters sent to the author by people uh, initially unknown to him. And I say initially because some of those um, fan mail correspondents became regular correspondents, uh, and then actually some of them became personal friends of Tolkien. So I thought this might be an interesting way to look at uh, not just the popularity of the work, but readers' responses to it, um, and to assess what they liked or didn't like, why they felt compelled to write to the author. Um, the fan mail at the Bodleian is not available to researchers. Um, this is mostly for data protection reasons. In a lot of our modern collections, we wouldn't be able to make them available until we were sure that all the correspondence in those files were dead. And so we generally put like a hundred year closure on that just to be absolutely sure. Um, and there's a surprising amount of personal information in those letters to Tolkien. People do share um, their trials and tribulations, their health, uh, their mental health. Um, so it would be classified as um, special, special category personal data. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you sort of an overview. I've looked at some of the statistics from that fan mail. And then to look at Tolkien's responses to it, um, I've looked purely at his published letters. So that's something that we can all go to and get a lot out of. So his fan mail really begins 1937 with The Hobbit. And the first letter he gets is from Arthur Ransom, who at that time was a well-known children's author. He'd published, um, I think, seven of the Swallows and Amazon series at that time. And they'd go on to be another uh, five books published. Um, the Hobbit was published in September 1937 and Ransom wrote to Tolkien in early December. And, well, according to the archive, that's the first piece of fan mail that he received. And Tolkien was delighted to get it because his own children were fans of the Swallows and Amazon series. Um, so he wrote... Uh, Ransom wrote to Tolkien to say that... Um, he was a humble hobbit fancier, and one certain that your book will be many times uh, reprinted. And then er entering into the spirit of Tolkien's fantasy world, he said he wanted to draw his attention to some corrections that needed making. Uh, Tolkien had used the word man in one place to refer to the hobbit, Bilbo Baggins, and in another he'd used little boys to refer to goblins. Uh, and Ransom said, surely these were errors of the human scribe. Um, so Tolkien wrote back uh, within a day of receiving that letter uh, and uh, said that you know, he was very pleased with the close scrutiny of the text, but also this quote here, that his reputation would go with his children. Uh, the eldest are now rather to be classed as men, but on their shelves, winnowed of the chaff left behind in the nursery, I notice that their ransoms remain. Uh, what Tolkien didn't know, wasn't aware of, was that uh, Rans Arthur Ransom had been sent a complimentary copy of The Hobbit by the publisher, Stanley Unwin. Um, he was sent this on the 8th of December, and he had been told in the letter that accompanied it that a second printing was going to be issued shortly with colour illustrations by the author. So he wrote back to Stanley Unwin um, and said that uh, The Hobbit is my delight. Great fun. Uh, will the author's new coloured pictures include a portrait of Bilbo Baggins, or does he refrain? But before Stanley Henry could reply, 
that's when Ransom wrote to Tolkien before he even knew about the illustrations. But Stanley Unruh actually sent him four colour copies, not a book, I think it was still with the printer, but he had four colour copies of those illustrations and sent them to him. And the whole reason behind this was that um, although the Swallows and Amazons were very successful, they were published by Jonathan Cape. Um, and George Allen and Unwin had actually a prior relationship with Ransom, having published a non-fiction work called Recundra's First Cruise in 1923. And they were hoping to persuade Ransom to let them publish a children's version of Recundra's First Cruise. Um, so they were, they were kind of like trying to get on the coattails, really, of his success with Jonathan Cape. And they were using Tolkien and The Hobbit um, to, to boost their juvenile credentials. But on the whole, The Hobbit um, attracted only a small amount of fan mail. I think we've got about 20 letters in the archive um, from fans um, and received over a period of about 10 years as well. So um, quite a small amount. Most of them came from children, as you might expect. Um, some came from parents, booksellers and librarians. Um, I'm going to do a little swerve here, like Simon, and talk about C.S. Lewis um, for a minute or two. Um, Lewis, as you probably all know, was Tolkien's friend, a colleague in the English faculty since 1926. Um, and he was one of the first people to read The Hobbit in manuscript. Um, Tolkien lent it to him in 1933, and we know that he read it in January that year because he wrote to his friend Arthur Greaves about it on the 4th of Feb, 1933. And he says, since term began, I've had a delightful time reading a children's story which Tolkien has written. It's so exactly like what we would both have longed to write or read in 1916, so that one feels he's not making it up but merely describing the same world into which all three of us have the entry. Now, this isn't fan mail, I know that, because it's not written to the author for a start, and it's by his friend, and not a stranger. Um, but it is really interesting, um, because Lewis himself, after this point, would become a famous author. In fact, his first work of fiction was published later the same year, The Pilgrim's Regress. Uh, and then he went on and followed that up with his space trilogy, the Out of the Silent Palette, Planet, Perilandra, and That Hideous Strength. And that they were from 38 to 1945. And then in the 1950s, the seven Narnia books. So as well as being a friend and colleague, he was also a key member of the Inklings. Um, in fact, he and Tolkien were founder members or re-founder members, if you like, of this literary club. Um, where they gathered with their male friends to read aloud the works in progress. And they did this in a convivial atmosphere, sometimes combative, sometimes raucous, um, in the Eagle and Child pub on a Tuesday lunchtime, or here in, um, is it here, Simon? In, in yeah. Lewis's rooms in Morden College uh, on a Thursday evening. So C.S. Lewis heard The Lord of the Rings in progress being read out to him by Tolkien. Um, and he was a great fan, not just of The Hobbit, but of The Lord of the Rings, and really encouraged Tolkien to uh, complete it and to persevere with the work. And he was also one of the people to write a first fan letter, if you like. In 1949, way before publication, he read uh, the manuscript of The Lord of the Rings. And his fan letter to Tolkien starts, I have drained the rich cup and satisfied a long thirst. So I think it was just really worth just having that aside about C.S. Lewis, because it's pretty remarkable. I think you've got two such famous authors um, and you've got Lewis's very early response to both The Hobbit and to The Lord of the Rings. So even though he'd read it in 1949, it was quite a long time then before Tolkien managed to get it published in 1954 and 55. But right from the outset, it attracted far more fan mail than The Hobbit ever had done. In Britain, it was published in three parts um, between July 1954 and October 1955. And readers began to write to Tolkien as soon as The Fellowship of the Ring was published. So we know that came out on the 29th of July, 1954. And the first uh, fan mail in the archive is 12 days later. 
written on the 10th of August. It's difficult now to put yourself in the position of a contemporary author uh, and think about what it was like to be waiting for each volume to be published. Um, they had to wait for four months for the second volume to come out and then almost a year before the return of the king. And it was similar in America. Um, Horton Mifflin were the publisher in the United States. They published The Fellowship of the Ring in October 1954. And then six months later, The Two Towers. Uh, and then the quest was finally completed eight months after that. So there are some anguished letters from fans in the archive. Please, please, when is the third volume to come? It's agonizing to have to wait for the doom of Aragorn and Frodo too. Please let it be soon. An American mother who was waiting for the final volume to arrive in the post wrote to say, I'm entirely anxious to receive the last part of your trilogy. I only hope it arrives at a suitable time for my family will have to get their own dinner out of cans if it is received in the afternoon. I shall be curled up in my canvas campaign chair until Frodo or the ring is delivered. Um, but a British reader just merely chastised him. How can you keep us in such terrible suspense? So there's plenty of these letters. I mean, it is an awful long time to wait, and a whole year um, between the end of the two towers where Sam is left in the dark beneath Kirith Ungol and Frodo's taken alive by the enemy. So who wrote to Tolkien? In the archive, I've identified 1,725 individual correspondence. That's in the period 1954 to 1973. Where did they come from? Well, the English speaking world, really, as, uh, as this shows on the blue side. Um, sorry, it's very, very kind. Probably. The blue side is the British. Um, they're the winners, 826 British correspondents. The Americans are close, are close by, 700 American correspondents. Um, and there's some, um, uh, obviously, Canadian, Australia, New Zealand. Um, there's also Dutch and Swedish because they were very early translations. Um, the green area, which is just other, um, it looks a bit overbalanced, really, because actually that's just one or two letters from all over the globe. So I would guess that they were English speaking, probably English or American um, people, but they were living in different places all around the globe. So North Borneo, Turkey, Malta, South Africa. Um, so it's just one or two from all those and grouped together. It looks, uh, looks a bit bigger than it should, really. I wondered whether um, more men wrote to Tolkien than women. So I looked at the gender of the fan mail. Um, yep, the men do have it, but it's pretty close split, actually. The blue side is uh, the male correspondents. Uh, the orange side is the female correspondents. And the gray area it was uh, unidentified. People who just wrote with a, an initial and a surname. Um, so it's pretty even split, I would say. It would have been nice to try and calculate the ages of correspondence, but this really isn't obvious from a letter, not unless they're children. I, there are quite a lot of letters from children for Lord of the Rings, um, and they often helpfully put their age in there. Um, I think it's it comes across definitely that it's popular amongst college students and university students. But I really do think that there's a big age range as well that has a wide ranging appeal. And Tolkien predicted this himself actually in 1947, um, way before publication. He said to his publisher, or he wrote to his publisher, those that like this kind of thing at all like it very much and cannot get anything like enough of it. The taste may be, alas, numerically limited, but where it exists, the taste is not limited by age or profession. 
this was based really on the small number of, of friends and colleagues who had read the book and manuscript or heard it and read aloud. And indeed, when it was published, it did have a very wide appeal. We have letters from poets, pop stars, prisoners, princesses, and from young and old alike. Uh, so how much fan mail did you receive? I said so 1,725 correspondents that I could identify, but there are over 2,000 individual um, fan mail letters. And actually, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I haven't written it down in my notes, but Joy Hill, who um, helped uh, an employee of George Allen and Unwin, who helped to manage the fan mail, um, said that in the by the 1970s, she was dealing with about 200 letters a week. Um, so that just makes 2,000 look like a drop in the ocean. Um, so we do know that um, they were dealt with by the publisher from the mid-1960s onwards. Um, so that's when um, we would see far less of the material coming into the archive. Um, it really increased hugely when, uh, in 1965, Ace Books published an authorised edition in paperback in the May of 1965. And that book was much cheaper than the three-volume hardback edition, which had been available before, and it began to sell in huge numbers. Um, unfortunately, Tolkien was not receiving any royalties from that, and the, the War of Middle-earth ensued, as American fans became aware of the situation. And in fact, uh, Tolkien took a very active role himself in this affair and uh, weaponized his fan mail by, he said, making a point of including a note in every answer or acknowledgement of fan letters from the USA to the effect that the paperback edition of Ace Books is piratical and issued without the consent of my publishers or myself, and of course, without re remuneration to us. And that letter is dated 25th of May, so the same month the Ace Books was published. Um, so Tolkien's using all the fan mail that comes from America to tell them about the situation. Um, Ace Books, the edition wasn't actually strictly piratical uh, or illegal. Um, it, was, it was certainly immoral, but um, they were just exploiting a loophole caused by um, the negligence of Horton Mifflin, Tolkien's American publisher. You hadn't properly copyrighted it. But anyway, due in part to Tolkien's help and the, uh, the outrage of his American fans, um, Ace Books caved in by the end of that year and offered him a royalty on every copy that had already been sold and a promise not to print any more. But the whole saga really had disrupted um, Tolkien's work on the Silmarillion because in order to counter the unauthorised paperback, he had to bring out new editions of both The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings for his authorised American publisher. So he had to make some significant alterations to both the books um, for them to count as a new edition. <coughs> and so he had to work on this you know, and prioritise it above everything else. I mean, on, on the good side, um, there was certainly a huge amount of publicity for the book and you know, the new, both the Ace, public, Ace Paperback edition and then the Ballantine Books, the American authorised edition, um, created huge sales because they were now in, in paperback and they were cheaper. But uh, this drove up his fan mail. That's the downside. There's his fan mail uh, by year at the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see, but there's the first spike is... Uh, the publication of Return of the King in 1955. Uh, and then that's really dwarfed by what happens in 65, 66, 67, um, when the fan mail just peaked hugely. And it was at that time, really, that um, his publisher decided um, to do something about it. So why did so many readers write to him? What did they want? Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that it was quite an effort in um, the mid-20th century 
to write a letter to your author, your favorite author. It's not like now you can't just do a quick Google search. You know, you, you can't put something on social media and say what you thought about something. Um, readers had to get, you know, pen, paper, an envelope, postage stamps. They had to write something out longhand. Then they had to find the address either for Tolkien or his publisher. To do that, you would have to go to a library and look in a reference book, maybe Who's Who or something like that. Then you would have to go and post the letter or maybe go to the post office and get international postage. So it's, it's not a straightforward thing. So why did so many people do it? Tolkien gives us a clue himself. In the second edition, the foreword that he wrote for that, um, which was actually to, to counter the Ace Books edition, he says, the prime motive was the desire of a tale teller to try his hand at a really long story that would hold the attention of readers, amuse them, delight them, and at times maybe excite them or deeply move them. As a guide, I had only my own feelings for what is appealing or moving. I think the key thing there is that he wanted to amuse them, delight them, excite them, deeply move them. And I think he definitely succeeded in that. That's what we can see in the reaction of readers to the story. They're so moved by it, they feel compelled to write to the author. Most of them just simply wanted to express their pleasure in the book. And Tolkien was delighted um, to hear that. Um, others had legitimate questions that the book had left unanswered. Um, and that was intriguing as well. So how did Tolkien respond to it? He wrote to his friend Kay Farah, his friend and neighbour, actually, um, just after the publication of The Return of the King, and said, I'm surprised at the reception of the ring and immensely pleased. I don't think I have started any tide. I don't think such a small hobbit-like creature, or even a man of any size, does that. If there is a tide, I think there is, then I'm just lucky enough to, to have caught it. So he's been typically modest there, but um, I think it was it was fascinating to him. You know, it took him a long time to write The Lord of the Rings from 1937. Um, he finished it in about 1949, but then it was a long time getting it published. And in all that time, he didn't know whether it was going to be successful, whether it was going to sell, whether it was going to be critically acclaimed. So to suddenly on publication have readers writing to him, saying how much pleasure they're getting from it um, and reading it with very close attention and, and you know, asking detailed questions um, was very encouraging to him, flattering, I suppose. Um, and for the first five years, he would reply to most of his fan mail with a handwritten letter. Um, he particularly liked uh, people who had read it with close attention. Um, he would ask intelligent questions um, and he would often become engaged in researching the answers uh, and writing lengthy responses. One of the problems with this is that when uh, a reader received a handwritten letter from their favourite author, they were inclined to write back. <laughs> and so the fan mail could uh, escalate. Um, but really, it was the Ace Books affair um, that drove it all to fever pitch. I mean, it was steadily increasing, if you can remember the chart. It was gradually rising up to that peak around the Ace Books. Um, and I guess Tolkien became a bit jaded by it, to be honest. Um, the demands on his time uh, it, it became quite burdensome, the demands from readers. We've got to bear in mind that he was 63 years old when The Lord of the Rings was published. He was still a full-time university professor um, and he was getting close to retirement. So here we can see some of the things that uh, fans are sending him. They sent him photographs of themselves and their friends dressed up as characters. They sent photographs of places that looked like Middle Earth as far away as Hawaii and Australia. And they sent him badges, drawings, poems, gifts of wine and cranberries. 
they pleaded to meet him in person, to interview him, to photograph him. They asked for his permission to write plays, operas, films, even books based on his work. They asked if they could name their houses, restaurants, pedigree dogs, Siamese cats, herds of cattle, even their own children after characters and places in Lord of the Rings. In May 1964, a hydrofoil made its maiden voyage across the channel from England to France carrying passengers. It was called Shadow Fax. Tolkien was horrified that his invented names could be used without his permission. He wrote to Rayner Unwin, I wish that copyright could protect names. I must say I was piqued by the christening of that monstrous hydrofoil shadow fax. Without so much as a by your leave. I'm getting used to Rivendells, Lorians, Imladris, etc. as house names. Though maybe they are more frequent than the letters which say by your leave. Shortly after that, he started consulting lawyers about whether he could patent his invented languages and the names that he created, but found that at that time that trademarks could only be applied to physical products and not to names. But by the time of the Ace Books Affair 1965, his publisher decided enough was enough. He was never going to produce the Silmarillion or any other work if he was so bogged down by the requests um, from fan mail. Uh, so they offered to take on um, replying to most of the fan mail and only send on a small proportion to him that required his him to answer. Uh, probably things like that were written in Elvish that you know, they would send on to him. Um, so Joy Hill, who I've mentioned before, she was employed by George Allen and Unwin. And she started to deal with all his fan mail and um, she devised a standard response. <coughs> I don't know if it's very clear, I'll read it out. It says, thank you very much for your kind letter about the Lord of the Rings. I was very pleased to have it, and I hope you will forgive the long delay in acknowledging it. I've had rather a lot of letters since the book came out, and I have also been ill. So Clyde Kilby, who visited Tolkien on a regular basis during the summer of 1966 to help with the Silmarillion, noted that Tolkien had three different forms of response to fan mail. This purely form letter, uh, this same letter, but with Tolkien's signature at the bottom, and then a response dictated to his secretary. Um, so it seems clear that he was not very often writing a handwritten response um, from the mid-1960s onwards. Joy Hill also suggested that he remove his telephone number from the public directory um, as he was uh, getting rather a lot of calls from fans um, and some of his American fans would ring in the middle of the night unaware of the time difference between Oxford and California. So he agreed and he said um, probably preferable to um, the method adopted by C.S. Lewis's brother, Major W.H. Lewis, who would lift the receiver and just repeat Oxford Sewage Disposal Unit <laughs> until they went away. Uh, nevertheless, his uh, Tolkien's address was still published in reference works and readers would turn up at his house uninvited and even take photographs through the window as he was sitting at the breakfast table. <laughs> so by 1968, he was aged 76, um, feeling rather besieged, he and his wife moved from Oxford and went to live in the south coast in Poole in Dorset, um, where they enjoyed many holidays in the years prior to that. So really Tolkien comes, becomes overwhelmed by the response to the Lord of the Rings, and that's not just the fan mail. It's... Um, it's the other requests, you know, for interviews, for appearances, for talks, to write things, to judge competitions. Um, it all became very difficult for him. And he did come from that generation where it was considered rude not to write a handwritten response. So even though they had this form letter, I know that he did um, write responses um, right up until he, he died, really. Uh, and he would have found it, I think, psychologically quite difficult to send out this form letter um, because even if he typed a letter um, to a colleague or friend, 
you would apologize for it. And so it was something rude not to write in your own hand. Um, and I think that's just the era that he was brought up in. Um, so winners and losers, I'll call this next paragraph. Um, so he was probably less inclined to give an informative response if uh, the reader had made demands on him. You know, if they wanted information for a school assignment or if they asked for personal details or if they asked him to give a talk or if they said they were going to turn up at a certain time at his house and talk to him about the book. I mean, all these sort of things were just irritating for him. Um, also, he's particularly annoyed when readers wrote to him and said that they were going to write a book based on his characters or use his invented language in their own books. I mean, he was like, why don't just make up your own? Um, but some letters definitely have brought forth uh, a much more expansive response from him. Uh, certainly anything in the 1950s, anybody who got in early with their fan mail would have been quite lucky, I think, because they would have almost certainly got a handwritten response um, before he got jaded or overwhelmed, rather. He always took a lot of care when responding to children. Um, it's quite obvious when the letters are from children. And having four children of his own, he was very careful um, not to patronise and not, not be dismissive, but you know, give them lots of, of clear uh, information and encouragement. Um, there's this lovely letter from Hugh Brogan. Um, age 12, who wrote to Tolkien, in 1948 this is, so this is about The Hobbit, and he says, it's wonderful, I beg you to write another, I'm filled with a burning curiosity about the Goblin Wars, the Mines of Moria, and above all, Mirkwood, I can't find them in the encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so this was the perfect time to, to contact Tolkien, because he's almost finished The Lord of the Rings, and this is going to answer all Hugh Brogan's questions. Um, and actually, this is the start of a lifelong correspondence between them and a friendship between them. Um, I had a bit of a, a, a look into Hugh Brogan. His parents were academics. Um, his father had been a fellow at Corpus Christi in Oxford. And then uh, at the end of the Second World War, he went to Cambridge. His, his family moved to Cambridge. And um, he was offered a professorship there. His wife was also an academic, um, an archaeologist. And Hugh Bergen himself grew up to be um, an academic. And so when Tolkien went over periodically to Cambridge um, to do his own medieval research, he would call in on the Brogans and, and uh, catch up with Hugh Bergen. And in fact, he calls him... Um, his most faithful fan since he was a small boy. Tolkien's interest was often captured by uh, people's names, people writing to him, um, like Sam Glenji, <laughs> that caught his attention. Um, and he was also interested in letters referring to the names that he'd invented. And even as late as 1972, he writes a very interesting response to a fan who asks him if she can name her uh, herd of cattle um, after places and personal names in The Lord of the Rings. And Tolkien even offers to invent names for her. He gives her the elvish word for bull, which hasn't been published in anything at that point. It's Mundo. And he says, I should be very interested to hear what names you eventually choose as individual names. And he follows this up with another letter um, saying that uh, he's quite willing to invent names for the cows as well. I mean, that seems quite incredible. He's 80 years old. Um, you think he would really have had enough of fan mail by this time. Um, but he was influenced by who sent the letter, oh, uh, definitely, not just the children, but I mean, he received his own celebrity fan mail. So that starts in with The Hobbit, with Arthur Ransom, but he had celebrity fan mail from Iris Murdoch and Mary Reno, um, authors who he admired. And he was thrilled to receive letters and illustrations for Lord of the Rings from the Crown Princess of Denmark. Um, really though, I think it was the timing of the letter that was crucial. 
um, because it seems to be, you know, the same letter asking about minutiae, say, from the appendices, might be dismissed as, you know, why don't you read the book more closely? Or he might give a really, you know, fascinating response to it. So really, I think it depends when it dropped on his doormat and what was happening in his life at the time. He retired in 1959, but uh, even so, he was a very busy man after that point. He was pressed for academic editions, which he hadn't completed um, during his working life. He was also being pressed by his publisher for more literary work. And as the uh, printed response letter indicates, he was often ill. Uh, and of course, he was aging, so um, I'm beginning to feel his age, like Bilbo. But on the other hand, he was also quite lonely after retirement, I think. Um, he, had, he ceased that daily contact with the college, with his students, with his colleagues. Um, and in 1953, before he retired, he'd moved from the centre of Oxford up the hill to Headington, which is only two miles, but that quite steep hill, and when you get an elderly as well. Um, it's quite a distance then between him and the college life. So I think sometimes he'd get a letter and, and he'd respond to it and it'd be almost like he was writing to a friend or he was giving a tutorial to a student even, um, and elucidating a certain point. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to end with uh, a quote from Tolkien which really sums up the highs and lows of the fame that came to him late in life. Uh, and which coloured all his later years. Being a cult figure in one's own lifetime, I'm afraid, is not at all pleasant. However, I do not find that it tends to puff one up. In my case, at any rate, it makes me feel extremely small and inadequate. But the nose of a very modest idol cannot remain entirely untickled by the sweet smell of incense. Thank you.